Water covers nearly three-fourths of our planet. But here's the catch. Only a tiny fraction of it is fresh, usable water. This fresh water, renewed by the hydrological cycle, should be enough for all of us. And yet, by 2025 nearly 2 billion people may live in absolute water scarcity. We often think of scarcity only in deserts or drought-prone areas. But the truth is, even regions with good rainfall can face shortages. Why? Overexploitation, unequal access, and growing demand. Cities are prime examples. A rising population needs more water. Not just for homes, but to grow the food that sustains our billion-plus population. Agriculture is by far our largest water consumer, and to meet its demands we often turn to irrigated farming, which relies heavily on a hidden resource – groundwater. This ancient water, stored in underground aquifers, is being pumped out relentlessly through millions of wells and tube wells, at a rate far faster than nature can replenish it. The consequences are stark. Rapidly falling water tables force farmers to dig deeper, more expensive wells, threatening not just their livelihoods, but our long-term food security. Beyond the fields, our rapidly growing cities and industries are also incredibly thirsty. Industrialization requires massive volumes of water for cooling and manufacturing. Simultaneously, urban lifestyles concentrate demand. To cope, many large housing societies drill their own bore wells, directly tapping into already overstressed aquifers and pushing them to the very brink of collapse. And scarcity isn't just about quantity, it's critically about quality. Sometimes there's enough water, but it's dangerously polluted. Our rivers and groundwater are often treated as dumping grounds, contaminated by domestic waste, industrial effluents, and agricultural chemicals. This widespread pollution renders the water hazardous, making it unsafe to drink and posing a grave risk to public health. To tackle this, initiatives like the Atal Bujal Yojana aim to shift communities from a use more mindset to smart water management. It empowers local bodies in stressed areas to create water budgets and security plans. Complementing this, the Jal Jeevan mission works to ensure every rural household gets safe piped water, at least 55 litres per person per day. This is about delivering health and dignity and freeing millions, especially women, from the daily drudgery of fetching water. The lesson is clear. Water is renewable but not limitless. Its cycle is fragile and easily broken by overuse and contamination. Conservation and wise management are the only ways to secure our health, our food and our future. We must embrace a new water consciousness, understanding that every drop saved today is a lifeline for tomorrow. The story of India is inseparable from the story of its water. From the earliest civilizations that flourished along its mighty rivers, the people of this land have understood a fundamental truth. To control water is to control life itself. This ancient wisdom wasn't just philosophy, it was etched into the very landscape in the form of sophisticated water management systems. Archaeological evidence reveals a legacy of brilliant hydraulic engineering. Consider Sringaverapura near Prayagraj. As far back as the 1st century BC, its inhabitants designed an ingenious system of channels and settling tanks to harvest the floodwaters of the Ganga, desilting it before storing the clean water for the dry season. This tradition continued through the ages. In the 11th century, the sprawling Bhopal Lake, one of the largest artificial lakes of its time, was created to serve an entire city. Three centuries later in Delhi, the Haus Kas tank supplied water to a growing population. Across the subcontinent, intricate step wells, or baulis, descended deep into the earth, providing communities with year-round access to water. Dams, reservoirs, embankments and canals were the arteries of ancient and medieval India. They were lifelines that sustained agriculture through unpredictable monsoons, quenched the thirst of growing cities and underpinned the prosperity of entire kingdoms. After independence in 1947, this legacy of water management was reimagined on a monumental scale. The new, modern India sought to build on this tradition, embarking on ambitious, multi-purpose river valley projects designed to power a developing nation. These were a departure from the past. While traditional structures were often focused on irrigation or local water supply, these new mega dams were designed as integrated systems. Their purpose was manifold, generating clean hydroelectricity to power new industries, supplying drinking water to burgeoning urban centers, taming destructive floods, creating navigable waterways for trade, fostering inland fisheries, and even providing spaces for public recreation. Iconic projects like the Bakra Nangal on the Sutlej Base River Basin 
and the Hiraku Dam on the Mahanadi became powerful symbols of this new era. They were engineered to simultaneously irrigate vast tracts of agricultural land while generating thousands of megawatts of power and protecting downstream areas from seasonal deluges. It's no wonder that India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, famously proclaimed these dams as the temples of modern India. In his vision, they were more than just concrete and steel. They were sacred sites of national development. They represented a vehicle for integrated growth, a promise to uplift the nation by connecting agricultural self-sufficiency with rapid industrialization and linking the prosperity of the village with the progress of the entire country. But this grand vision of progress was not without its shadows. Over time, the cracks in this model began to appear. The very scale of these large dams created a host of complex environmental problems. By their nature, they obstruct the natural free flow of rivers. This blockage prevents nutrient-rich sediment from traveling downstream, starving deltas of the fertile silt they need to thrive and leading to riverbed degradation. The impact on aquatic life has been severe. Dams act as impenetrable barriers, fragmenting river ecosystems and blocking the ancient migratory paths of fish which they need for spawning. This disrupts their life cycles and has led to a sharp decline in native fish populations in many dammed rivers. Behind the dam walls, vast reservoirs form, submerging immense areas of land. This often includes fertile agricultural plains and dense forests. The submerged vegetation slowly rots underwater, releasing significant amounts of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Furthermore, these projects have come at a tremendous social cost, displacing millions of people, often from tribal and rural communities, severing their connection to their ancestral lands and livelihoods. And in a cruel irony, the very dams built to control floods have, in some cases, exacerbated them. As the trapped sediment builds up in the reservoir over decades, its water storage capacity steadily decreases. During periods of exceptionally heavy rainfall, dam operators are often forced to release massive volumes of water to prevent the dam from failing, unleashing sudden catastrophic floods on the unsuspecting communities downstream. In the face of these immense challenges, India is mobilizing modern solutions on a national scale. Flagship programs like the Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana have been launched with the ambitious motto of Harket Kopani, ensuring water reaches every single farm. This isn't just about building more canals, it's a paradigm shift towards efficiency and sustainability. The goal is to fundamentally change how we use water in agriculture, moving towards a future where every community has the water it needs to thrive. The initiative champions the principle of per drop, more crop. It actively promotes micro-irrigation technologies like drip and sprinkler systems which deliver water directly to the roots of plants, cutting down on the massive losses from evaporation and runoff seen in traditional flood irrigation. By improving water use efficiency, expanding the area under assured irrigation, and encouraging water conservation at the farm level, the program aims to build resilience against erratic monsoons and secure the livelihoods of millions of farmers. On a monumental scale, we see projects like the Sardar Saravar Dam on the Namada River. This multi-purpose mega-project is an engineering marvel, designed to serve the needs of four states, Gujarat, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, and Madhya Pradesh. Its primary objective is to tame the river's flow and redirect its waters to some of the most arid parts of the country. The project's vast network of canals brings life-giving irrigation to millions of hectares, transforming barren, drought-prone regions into productive agricultural lands. Beyond farming, it generates clean hydroelectric power and supplies drinking water to thousands of villages and cities. It stands as a testament to human ambition to re-engineer the landscape to meet our needs, promising to make vast areas drought-proof. However, such large-scale interventions also spark critical debate about their social and ecological costs reminding us that the path to water security is complex. But what if the most resilient solutions aren't just the biggest and newest? What if they are hidden in plain sight, woven into the fabric of our own history? For thousands of years, long before concrete dams and intricate pipelines, communities across India had mastered the art of water harvesting. These weren't primitive efforts. They were sophisticated systems of ecological engineering, perfectly attuned to the local landscape. In the Western Himalayas, farmers built gulls or kuls, ingenious diversion channels, that tapped into glacial streams, 
using nothing but the force of gravity to guide water along mountain contours to terraced fields. These channels were the lifeline of the community, built and maintained through collective effort, a testament to social cooperation. In the floodplains of Bengal, instead of fighting the annual deluge, people learned to work with it. They created intricate networks of inundation channels that would, during the monsoon floods, carry nutrient-rich water and silt to their fields, providing both irrigation and natural fertilization for their crops. Across the arid Thar Desert, where rain is a rare and precious gift, entire agricultural landscapes were designed to function as storage basins. Structures like the Kadins of Jasalma, which are simple earthen embankments, would capture the monsoon runoff. This water would stand and seep into the soil, and once it evaporated, farmers would plant crops on the moisture-laden land. Similarly, Yohads in other parts of Rajasthan served as community-managed percolation ponds, recharging groundwater for everyone. Perhaps the most intimate form of water harvesting was practiced at home. In Rajasthan's semi-arid towns like Bikana, Falodi and Barma, nearly every dwelling was designed around an underground tank or tanker. These were not mere systems, they were architectural marvels. Some were as large as a big room, meticulously constructed and connected to the sloping rooftops by a network of pipes. A well-maintained tanker was a source of pride, a symbol of a family's self-sufficiency. The system was brilliantly simple. The first spell of rain was allowed to wash the roof and pipes clean. Subsequent showers would then be diverted to fill the tanker with what is lovingly called palar pani, considered the purest form of water a cool, sweet alternative to the often saline groundwater of the desert. This precious resource was stored safely underground, away from the scorching sun, providing a reliable source of drinking water until the next monsoon arrived. Today, this ancient wisdom is experiencing a powerful revival. Consider Shillong in Meghalaya. The world's wettest places, like Mosinram and Cherapunji, lie just 55 kilometers away. Yet the city faces an acute water shortage. Here, rooftop rainwater harvesting is not a novelty, but a vital necessity, bridging the gap left by inadequate municipal supply. In Gendatha, a remote village in Karnataka, this practice has transformed the community. Here, around 200 homes have adopted rooftop rainwater harvesting. With each household collecting an estimated 50,000 litres annually, the village has become water-rich, a shining example of community-led water security. Recognizing its potential, Tamil Nadu took a pioneering step, becoming the first Indian state to make rooftop rainwater harvesting legally compulsory for all houses. This bold policy, born out of recurring water crises in cities like Chennai, has led to a significant rise in depleted groundwater levels, proving that widespread adoption can have a massive collective impact. In Meghalaya, another living marvel of indigenous engineering thrives, the bamboo drip irrigation system, this is biomimicry at its best, a system perfected over generations. For over 200 years, tribal farmers have tapped perennial streams and springs using an intricate network of bamboo pipes to carry water over hundreds of meters. They use bamboo of varying diameters to control the flow, splitting the main channel into smaller and smaller diversions. The system cleverly manipulates gravity, ultimately delivering 18 to 20 liters of water from the source which is then reduced to a mere 20 to 80 drops per minute, delivered directly at the base of the plant. No pumps, no electricity, no waste, just the gentle, persistent work of gravity and profound ecological skill. From the tankers of the desert to the bamboo aqueducts of the hills, these living traditions prove that sustainable water management isn't a modern invention. It is an ancient, accumulated wisdom a legacy that we must not just preserve but actively revive, protect and adapt for the challenges of the future. The path forward does not lie in a choice between modern projects and traditional practices, but in their intelligent integration. Multi-purpose projects will remain powerful tools for development, but their design and operation must evolve. They must balance human needs with the ecological health of the river basins they depend on, ensuring what is known as environmental flows the minimum quantity of water required to sustain aquatic ecosystems. After all, rivers are not just resources to be harnessed and diverted. They are the arteries of our planet, living systems that command our respect and demand our protection. Our future depends on renewing our relationship with water, one built on wisdom, balance and reverence.